The Chessmen of Mars. Chapter 15. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 15. The Old Man of the Pits. I shall not desert you, Ghek, said Tara of Helium simply. Go, go, whispered the Kaldane. You can do me no good. Go, or all I have done is for naught. Tara shook her head. I cannot, she said. They will slay her, said Ghek to Turan, and the panthon, torn between loyalty to this strange creature who had offered its life for him and love of the woman, hesitated but a moment. Then he swept Tara from her feet and lifting her in his arms leaped up the steps that led to the throne of Manator. Behind the throne he parted the arras and found the secret opening. Into this he bore the girl, and down a long, narrow corridor and winding runways that led to lower levels until they came to the pits of the palace of Otar. Here was a labyrinth of passages and chambers presenting a thousand hiding places. As Turan bore Tara up the steps toward the throne, a score of warriors rose as though to rush forward to intercept them. Stay, cried Ghek, or your jeddak dies, and they halted in their tracks, waiting the will of this strange, uncanny creature. Presently Ghek took his eyes from the eyes of Otar, and the jeddak shook himself as one who would be rid of a bad dream and straightened up half days still. Look, said Ghek, then, I have given your Jeddak his life, nor have I harmed one of those whom I might easily have slain when they were in my power. No harm have I or my friends done in the city of Manator. Why then should you persecute us? Give us our lives, give us our liberty. Otar, now in command of his faculties, stooped and regained his sword. In the room was silence, as all waited to hear the Jeddak's answer. Just are the laws of Manator, he said at last. Perhaps, after all, there is truth in the words of the stranger. Return him then to the pits, and pursue the others and capture them. Through the mercy of Otar they shall be permitted to win their freedom upon the field of Jitan in the coming games. Still ashen was the face of the Jeddak as Ghek was led away and his appearance was that of a man who had been snatched from the brink of eternity into which he has gazed, not with the composure of great courage, but with fear. There were those in the throne room who knew that the execution of the three prisoners had been but delayed and the responsibility placed upon the shoulders of others, and one of those who knew was Uthor, the great Jed of Manatos. His curling lip betokened his scorn of the Jeddak, who had chosen humiliation rather than death. He knew that Otar had lost more of prestige in those few moments than he could regain in a lifetime, for the Martians are jealous of the courage of their chiefs. There can be no evasions of stern duty, no temporizing with honor. That there were others in the room who shared Uthor's belief was evidenced by their silence and the grim scowls. Otar glanced quickly around. He must have sensed the hostility and guessed its cause, for he went suddenly angry, and as one who seeks by the vehemence of his words to establish the courage of his heart, he roared forth what could be considered as naught other than a challenge. "'The will of Otar, the Jeddak, is the law of Manator,' he cried, "'and the laws of Manator are just. They cannot err. Udor, Dispatch those who will search the palace, the pits, and the city, and return the fugitives to their cells. And now for you, Udor of Manatos, think you with impunity to threaten your Jeddak, to question his right to punish traitors and instigators of treason? What am I to think of your own loyalty, who takes to wife a woman I have banished from my court because of her intrigues against the authority of her Jeddak? and her master. But Otar is just. Make your explanations and your peace, then, before it is too late. Uthor has nothing to explain, 
replied the Jed of Manatos. Nor is he at war with his Jeddak, but he has the right that every Jed and every warrior enjoys, of demanding justice at the hands of the Jeddak for whomsoever he believes to be persecuted. With increasing rigor has the Jeddak of Manator persecuted the slaves from Gathol since he took to himself the unwilling Princess Haja. If the slaves from Gathol have harbored thoughts of vengeance and escape, tis no more than might be expected from a proud and courageous people. Ever have I counseled greater fairness in our treatment of our slaves, many of whom, in their own lands, are people of great distinction and power, but always has Otar, the Jeddak, flouted with arrogance my every suggestion. Though it has been through none of my seeking that the question has arisen now, I am glad that it has, for the time was bound to come when the Jeds of Manator would demand from Otar the respect and consideration that is their due from the man who holds his high office at their pleasure. Know then, Otar, that you must free Akor the Dwar, forthwith or bring him to fair trial before the assembled Jeds of Manator. I have spoken. You have spoken well and to the point, Uthor, cried Otar, for you have revealed to your Jeddak and your fellow Jeds the depth of the disloyalty that I have long suspected. Akor already has been tried and sentenced by the Supreme Tribunal of Manator, Otar the Jeddak, and you too shall receive justice from the same unfailing source. In the meantime you are under arrest. To the pits with him! To the pits with Uthor, the false Jed! He clapped his hands to summon the surrounding warriors to do his bidding. A score leaped forward to seize Uthor. They were warriors of the palace, mostly, but two score leaped to defend Uthor, and with ringing steel they fought at the foot of the steps to the throne of Manator where stood Otar, the Jeddak, with drawn sword ready to take his part in the melee. At the clash of steel palace guards rushed to the scene from other parts of the great building, until those who would have defended Uthor were outnumbered two to one and then the Jed of Manatos slowly withdrew with his forces, and fighting his way through the corridors and chambers of the palace came at last to the avenue. Here he was reinforced by the little army that had marched with him into Manator. Slowly they retreated toward the gate of enemies between the rows of silent people looking down upon them from the balconies, and there, within the city walls, they made their stand. In a dimly lighted chamber beneath the palace of Otar, the Jeddak, Turan the Panthon, lowered Tara of Helium from his arms and faced her. "'I am sorry, Princess,' he said, "'that I was forced to disobey your commands, or to abandon Gek, but there was no other way. Could he have saved you I would have stayed in his place. Tell me that you forgive me.' "'How could I do less?' she replied graciously but it seemed cowardly to abandon a friend. Had we been three fighting men it had been different, he said. We could only have remained and died together, fighting. But you know, Tara of Helium, that we may not jeopardize a woman's safety, even though we risk the loss of honor. I know that, Turan, she said, but no one may say that you have risked honor who knows the honor and bravery that are yours. He heard her with surprise for these were the first words that she had spoken to him that did not savor of the attitude of a princess to a panthon, though it was more in her tone than the actual words that he apprehended the difference. How at variance were they to her recent repudiation of him? He could not fathom her, and so he blurted out the question that had been in his mind since he had told Otar that she did not know him. Tara of Helium, he said. Your words are balm to the wound you gave me in the throne room of Otar. Tell me, Princess, why you denied me. She turned her great deep eyes up to his, and in them was a little of reproach. You did not guess, she asked, that it was my lips alone and not my heart that denied you. Otar had ordered that I die, more because I was a companion of Gek than because of any evidence against me and so I knew that if I acknowledged you as one of us you would be slain too. It was to save me then? he cried, his face suddenly lighting. It was to save my brave Panthon, she said in a low voice. 
Tara of Helium," said the warrior, dropping to one knee, "your words are as food to my hungry heart," and he took her fingers in his and pressed them to his lips. Gently she raised him to his feet. "'You need not tell me, kneeling,' she said softly. Her hand was still in his as he rose, and they were very close, and the man was still flushed with the contact of her body since he had carried her from the throne room of Otar. He felt his heart pounding in his breast, and the hot blood surging through his veins as he looked at her beautiful face, with its downcast eyes and the half-parted lips that he would have given a kingdom to possess. And then he swept her to him, and as he crushed her against his breast his lips smothered hers with kisses. But only for an instant. Like a tigress the girl turned upon him, striking him and thrusting him away. She stepped back, her head high and her eyes flashing fire. "'You would dare!' she cried. "'You would dare thus defile a princess of Helium?' His eyes met hers squarely, and there was no shame and no remorse in them. "'Yes, I would dare,' he said. "'I would dare love Tara of Helium, but I would not dare defile her or any woman with kisses that were not prompted by love of her alone. He stepped closer to her and laid his hands upon her shoulders. "'Look into my eyes, daughter of the warlord,' he said, "'and tell me that you do not wish the love of Turan the Panthon.' "'I do not wish your love,' she cried, pulling away. "'I hate you!' And then, turning away, she bent her head into the hollow of her arm and wept. The man took a step toward her, as though to comfort her, when he was arrested by the sound of a crackling laugh behind him. Wheeling about, he discovered a strange figure of a man standing in a doorway. It was one of those rarities occasionally to be seen upon Barsoom, an old man with the signs of age upon him. Bent and wrinkled, he had more the appearance of a mummy than a man. "'Love in the pits of Otar!' he cried and again his thin laughter jarred upon the silence of the subterranean vaults. A strange place to woo, a strange place to woo indeed. When I was a young man we roamed in the gardens beneath giant Pimales and stole our kisses in the brief shadows of hurtling Thuria. We came not to the gloomy pits to speak of love, but times have changed and ways have changed though I had never thought to live to see the time when the way of a man with a maid, or a maid with a man, would change. Ah, but we kissed them then. And what if they objected, eh? What if they objected? Why, we kissed them more. Eh, eh? Those were the days. And he crackled again. Eh? Well do I recall the first of them I ever kissed, and I've kissed an army of them since. She was a fine girl but she tried to slip a dagger into me while I was kissing her. Eh, hey, hey, eh, those were the days, but I kissed her. She's been dead over a thousand years now, but she was never kissed again like that while she lived, I'll swear, not since she's been dead either. And then there was the other, but Turan, seeing a thousand or more years of osculatory memoirs portending, interrupted. Tell me, ancient one, not of thy loves, but of thyself. Who are you? What do you do here in the pits of Otar? I might ask you the same, young man, replied the other. Few there are who visit the pits other than the dead, except my pupils, eh? That is it. You are new pupils. Good. But never before have they sent a woman to learn the great art from the greatest artist. But times have changed. Now in my day the women did no work. They were just for kissing and loving. Eh, hey, those were the women. I mind the one we captured in the south, eh? She was a devil, but how she could love. She had breasts of marble and a heart of fire. Why, she—' "'Yes, yes,' interrupted Turan. "'We are pupils, and we are anxious to get to work. Lead on, and we will follow.' "'Eh, hey, yes, eh, hey, yes, come. All is rush and hurry as though there were not another countless myriad of ages ahead. Eh, hey, yes, as many as lie behind.' Two thousand years have passed since I broke my shell, and always rush, 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 yet I cannot see that aught has been accomplished. 
Manator is the same today as it was then, except the girls. We had the girls then. There was one that I gained upon the fields of Jitan. Eh, but you should have seen... Lead on, cried Turan. After we are at work you shall tell us of her. Eh, yes, said the old fellow, and shuffled off down a dimly lighted passage. Follow me. You are going with him? asked Tara. Why not? replied Turan. We know not where we are, or the way from these pits, for I know not east from west, but he doubtless knows, and if we are shrewd we may learn from him that which we would know. At least we cannot afford to arouse his suspicions. And so they followed him. Followed along winding corridors, and through many chambers, until they came at last to a room in which there were several marble slabs raised upon pedestals some three feet above the floor, and upon each slab lay a human corpse. "'Here we are,' exclaimed the old man. "'These are fresh, and we shall have to get to work upon them soon. I am working now on one for the gate of enemies. He slew many of our warriors. Truly is he entitled to a place in the gate. Come, you shall see him.' He led them to an adjoining apartment. Upon the floor were many fresh human bones, and upon a marble slab a mass of shapeless flesh. "'You will learn this later,' announced the old man, "'but it will not harm you to watch me now, for there are not many thus prepared, and it may be long before you have the opportunity to see another prepared for the gate of enemies. First, you see, I remove all the bones, carefully that the skin may be damaged as little as possible.' The skull is the most difficult, but it can be removed by a skillful artist. You see, I have made but a single opening. This I now sew up, and that done, the body is hung so. And he fastened a piece of rope to the hair of the corpse, and swung the horrid thing to a ring in the ceiling. Directly below it was a circular manhole in the floor, from which he removed the cover revealing a well, partially filled with a reddish liquid. Now we lower it into this, the formula for which you shall learn in due time. We fasten it thus to the bottom of the cover, which we now replace. In a year it will be ready, but it must be examined often in the meantime, and the liquid kept above the level of its crown. It will be a very beautiful piece, this one, when it is ready. And you are fortunate again, for there is one to come out today. He crossed to the opposite side of the room and raised another cover, reached in, and dragged a grotesque-looking figure from the hole. It was a human body, shrunk by the action of the chemical in which it had been immersed, to a little figure, scarce a foot high. "'Eh, is it not fine?' cried the little old man. "'Tomorrow it will take its place in the gate of enemies.' He dried it off with cloths and packed it away carefully in a basket. "'Perhaps you would like to see some of my life work,' he suggested, and without waiting for their assent led them to another apartment, a large chamber in which were forty or fifty people. All were sitting or standing quietly about the walls, with the exception of one huge warrior who best rode a great thoat in the very center of the room, and all were motionless. Instantly there sprang to the minds of Tara and Turan the rows of silent people upon the balconies that lined the avenues of the city, and the noble array of mounted warriors in the hall of chiefs, and the same explanation came to both, but neither dared voice the question that was in his mind, for fear of revealing by his ignorance the fact that they were strangers in Manator, and therefore impostors in the guise of pupils. "'It is very wonderful,' said Turan. It must require great skill and patience and time. That it does, replied the old man, though having done it so long I am quicker than most, but mine are the most natural. Why, I would defy the wife of that warrior to say that in so far as appearances are concerned he does not live, and he pointed at the man upon the thoat. Many of them, of course, are brought here wasted or badly wounded, and these I have to repair. That is where great skill is required, for every one wants his dead to look as they did at their best in life. But you shall learn to mount them and paint them and repair them, 
and sometimes to make an ugly one look beautiful, and it will be a great comfort to be able to mount your own. Why, for fifteen hundred years no one has mounted my own dead but myself. I have many. My balconies are crowded with them, but I keep a great room for my wives. I have them all, as far back as the first one, and many is the evening I spend with them, quiet evenings and very pleasant. And then the pleasure of preparing them, and making them even more beautiful than in life, partially recompenses one for their loss. I take my time with them, looking for a new one while I am working on the old. When I am not sure about a new one I bring her to the chamber where my wives are and compare her charms with theirs, and there is always a great satisfaction at such times in knowing that they will not object. I love harmony. Did you prepare all the warriors in the Hall of Chiefs? asked Turan. Yes, I prepare them and repair them, replied the old man. Otar will trust no other. Even now I have two in another room who were damaged in some way and brought down to me. Otar does not like to have them gone long, since it leaves two riderless thoats in the hall, but I shall have them ready presently. He wants them all there in the event any momentous question arises upon which the living Jeds cannot agree, or do not agree with Otar. Such questions he carries to the Jeds in the Hall of Chiefs. Then he shuts himself up alone with the great chiefs who have attained wisdom through death. It is an excellent plan, and there is never any friction or misunderstandings. Otar has said that it is the finest deliberative body upon Barsoom, much more intelligent than that composed of the living Jeds. But come, we must get to work. Come into the next chamber, and I will begin your instruction. He led the way into the chamber, in which lay the several corpses upon their marble slabs, and going to a cabinet he donned a pair of huge spectacles and commenced to select various tools from little compartments. This done, he turned again toward his two pupils. "'Now let me have a look at you,' he said. "'My eyes are not what they once were, and I need these powerful lenses for my work, or to see distinctly the features of those around me.' He turned his eyes upon the two before him. Turan held his breath, for he knew that now the man must discover that they wore not the harness or insignia of Manator. He had wondered before why the old fellow had not noticed it, for he had not known that he was half blind. The other examined their faces, his eyes lingering long upon the beauty of Tara of Helium, and then they drifted to the harness of the two. Turan thought that he noted an appreciable start of surprise on the part of the taxidermist, but if the old man noticed anything his next words did not reveal it. "'Come with Igos,' he said to Turan. I have materials in the next room that I would have you fetch hither. Remain here, woman, we shall be gone but a moment." He led the way to one of the numerous doors opening into the chamber and entered ahead of Turan. Just inside the door he stopped, and pointing to a bundle of silks and furs upon the opposite side of the room directed Turan to fetch them. The latter had crossed the room and was stooping to raise the bundle when he heard the click of a lock behind him. Wheeling instantly he saw that he was alone in the room and that the single door was closed. Running rapidly to it he strove to open it, only to find that he was a prisoner. Igos, stepping out and locking the door behind him, turned toward Tara. "'Your leather betrayed you,' he said, laughing his crackling laugh. "'You sought to deceive old Igos, but you found that though his eyes are weak his brain is not. But it shall not go ill with you. You are beautiful, and Igos loves beautiful women. I might not have you elsewhere in Manator, but here there is none to deny old Igos. Few come to the pits of the dead, only those who bang the dead, and they hasten away as fast as they can. No one will know that Igos has a beautiful woman locked with his dead. I shall ask you no questions, and then I will not have to give you up for I will not know to whom you belong, eh? And when you die I shall mount you beautifully and place you in the chamber with my other women. Will that not be fine, eh?" He had approached until he stood close beside the horrified girl. "'Come,' he cried, seizing her by the wrist. "'Come to Igos!' 
This is the end of The Chessmen of Mars, Chapter 15. Recording by Tom Weiss.